I'd like to introduce our own American Tiger, Dr. Jake Jabs. Can I have you introduce me to all my speeches? <laughs> Thank you so much. Very, very nice introduction. Thank you so much. I have a lot, lot to talk about. Thanks for inviting me. It's a great group. I, I'm a real believer in free trade and, and trade period, so we're going to talk about that. I'm not running for anything, so I, I can probably say anything I want. Huh? So, right? <laughs> um, how many of you here are from Colorado? Anybody here from? If this is a great day in Colorado, say yes. yes. Yeah. Um, how many of you bought furniture from American Furniture Warehouse? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> so it's a great, great, great venue. Uh, so uh, uh, Karen asked me to talk about a couple things. One is my journey on importing. I'm going to talk about that first and see how time permits. I might talk about my journey to American Furniture Warehouse. So I have a couple journeys to talk about. So my first journey to talk about uh, uh, imports, uh, American, I started American Furniture Warehouse in 1975. And, and in that time, I was having a price war with Kmart on a stop sign dinette. Anybody remember Kmart? Back then, they were in the furniture business. And we were having a little price war going on. And they were selling it for $198, I was selling this for $98, which is below cost, having price. Now, what I need to do, I need to figure out where Kmart's getting this, this dinette. Well, they were getting it from Taiwan. Can you guys remember when everything came from Taiwan to Hong Kong? Anybody remember that? Some of us olders do. So anyway, I decided to go to Taiwan. So this was in the late 70s. I went to Taiwan, start, start uh, buying furniture out of Taiwan and actually Hong Kong. Actually, there was markets at that time in Hong Kong and, 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 and Taiwan both. Well, what happened is uh, Taiwan got full. Taiwan's only an island, 22 square miles, 20 million people, and it got full. And I'm going to talk about getting full in some other countries. By getting full, I mean that they ran out of labor, the wages got too high, uh, land prices got too high. So la Taiwan got full. So uh, uh, what happened uh, when Mo Zedong and the Chinese communists took over China, uh, and Mo Zedong died in 1978, uh, Deng became the premier. Deng Xiaoping became the premier of China. And uh, he traveled to Hong Kong, and he was actually came to the US, and he decided to open up China for, for free market, free enterprise. So what happened when, when Taiwan got full, first place it went to was Malaysia. Malaysia was across, uh, not too far away. And Malaysia was a country of 30 million people. So and I followed these factories. Now these were Taiwanese, Chinese, uh, furniture people. And so they owned some big factories in Malaysia. And so I followed them up there. And actually I saw Malaysia got full. They ran out of labor. I'd be going through some of these factories there and I'd see a whole bunch of workers coming out in green uniform. And I said, where are they from? Well, they're from Bangladesh or Indonesia or somewhere else. So they were already porting workers into Malaysia. So Malaysia got full. So this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And so what happened, that's about the time that Deng did the experiment. His first experiment was, we're going to open a free enterprise zone in Zinzin, which is right across the Pearl River from, from Hong Kong. And, and, and at that time, Zinjin was about 3 million people. And I checked the other day, now Zinjin is 13 million people. <laughs> so this town of 3 million grew to 13 million people. And I saw that go. By the way, I go to Asia twice a year. And we always normally fly into Hong Kong, go through Zinjin, and Zinjin just, and it's still growing. It's just growing like this. So anyway, Malaysia got full. So these same factories, now these were factories owned by Taiwanese Chinese. So they went to China. So I followed them into China. And I remember the first time Green River uh, uh, was building a factory there in, in mainland China. And they said, Jake, uh, come and see our factory. I went and saw it. It was a 100,000 square feet factory. And they were making a chair for rooms to go. Uh, and, and one thing that, uh, the one reason that I think a lot of importers had advantage over the American companies, the American factories built too many products. 
Royal, Thomasville, Lane, and all these companies, they built bedroom, dining room, tables, occasional tent. They built way too many products. Well, over there, they were building a few products. Um, to this day, most of these factories there don't build a lot of different products. They maybe build just living room or just bedroom or just dining room, that type of thing. So anyway, they were training 100 uh, uh, employees to build a chair for rooms to go. Well, a few years later, uh, we, they, were, they had a 10 million square foot factory with 8,000 employees. So we saw this grow, 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 growth like that. Well, and then what happened, um, th China really got pretty full. Today, when we, when we start going to China, there always used to be a bunch of workers. Every factory we'd go to, there'd be a bunch of f factories uh, lined up to working there. Today, you go to China, there's no more lines of workers in factory. China, China got pretty full. Now, what happened on, on duties, tariffs? One of the first uh, tariffs in the furniture business, uh, the 29 Hillbilly, North Carolina furniture manufacturers decided to uh, put duties on bedroom sets coming out of China. They wanted 440% duty on bedroom sets coming out of China. And this was a huge division in, in the furniture business. Uh, we were all against it. The fact that the furniture whole industry was against it, but these 29 factories prevailed. By the way, this was during the Bush administration, by the way. Uh, so they did put uh, big duties on bedroom sets coming out of China. Uh, at that time, we were buying 22 bedroom sets out of China. Uh, so what happened is uh, basically, uh, you know, what happens on so many of these deals is the, is the big companies and the people with money that can hire the attorneys, that can do all, jump through all the hoops, everything, they get the beneficial tariffs. Uh, what happened in, in the tariffs with bedrooms, some of the big factories got 1% or 7%. The small factories got 200% duties. And what's, what's something that's really wrong with the whole tariff and duty thing is the small businesses and the small factories are the ones that get hurt the most because they don't have the resources, they don't have the attorneys, they don't have the wherewithal. A lot of them can't even speak English. So, they, they, so what happens, and that's what's happening today too, so you know, what you're going to see is a lot of the little factories are the ones that get clobbered. A lot of the big guys can move to another country or they can hire attorneys and get the lower tariffs or whatever. So anyway, that's one bad thing about tariffs and, and, and duties is that they hurt, hurt the small guy. And I, I'm a free trader, by the way. Am I, my mic okay? Uh, we brought a few of these things uh, to pass around. We didn't get enough for everybody. There were 700 people here, so we didn't make, but we made about three or four for each table. And uh, you might share this, share these with the tables. But one of the first things that I have to hand out there is a free trade article. And uh, I, I see now I'm going to have to redo this. This was good for a number of years, but now it's going to change. So, but this is uh, my take on trade here. Economists are virtually unanimous that trade makes uh, countries richer by enable countries to specialize to make workers more productive, give consumers more choice, and reduce cost. The logic has spurred a steady decline in the trade barriers since World War II, and since the 60s, the average world tariff has declined from close to 15% to now 7%, and the U.S., Japan, and European Union tariffs average 3%. This generated a corresponding surge in transport of trade that has dramatically raised the standard of living of people around the world. And that's what, that's, what, that's what trade does. So uh, the, the next uh, uh, article in, in the thing that, the, 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 the folder that you've got at your tables is about the, uh, the importing the bedroom sets. And this is the long version of it. I'll give you the short, short version of it. Uh, so what, what happened when they put the duties on the bedroom sets out of China, they moved to Vietnam. At that time, Vietnam was really not in the furniture business. So they all moved to Vietnam. So today, we're buying zero bedroom sets out of China. We're buying 22 bedroom sets out of Vietnam. And that's how it really happens. And that's what's happening right now. When they put the 10% duties on in September, uh, right away in the furniture business, a lot of factories said, we're going to Vietnam, we're going to Vietnam, we're going to Vietnam. Vietnam is a, basically 110 million people, and a lot of factories had already went to Vietnam, 
For example, it's an example, example, Ashley, which is the largest furniture uh, manufacturer in the world by far, they had a two million square foot plant in, in China, which they had closed and moved to Vietnam. They have over a million square foot factory in Vietnam. So a lot of fact, Green River, the Green River, who I said, I followed them from, from Taiwan to Malaysia to China, uh, closed their Chinese, their huge Chinese factory and moved to Vietnam. So this migration of factories has already been taking place because of the duties they put on bedroom sets. So today, Vietnam is a major producer of bedroom sets and other products too. Uh, Ashley just uh, closed their big plant in China and their new plant in, in Vietnam now is over a million square feet and they're also manufacturing leather, leather there. So uh, anyway, this whole tariff thing was huge at that time. I was actually on the front page of Wall Street Journal with my picture on Wall Street Journal on, on that article. Now, what's happening is, uh, what bothers me is America is becoming a protectionist state. Now, they're uh, going to put, uh, this is another new article here, uh, bedroom sets, they're going to, they're going to put, uh, or bedding, they're going to put duties on mattresses, and I think it's going to happen. We've been buying memory foam mattresses in a box out of China for 20 years. Now, the, these factories that are pushing to put duties on memory foam mattresses coming out of China, a lot of these overpriced mattresses like Tempur-Pedic, if you want an overpriced mattress, <laughs> they're repeating about their pushing. So what are they? This is this is called protection. They're trying to protect their own industries. So it's going to happen. They're going to land up putting big duties on, on mattresses coming out of China. Now, what's happened already, the factory that we were doing business for 20 years has already moved to Vietnam. So that's what they do. They move to the country that could be the low low, low, uh, low uh, uh, producer of goods. Uh, the the um, chickens and cabinet industry is trying to put duties on sets. Uh, they just put uh, duties on tomato. Big, have you, how many of you have seen where they put the big duties on tomatoes coming out of Mexico? How many of you like tomatoes? Say yes. Yeah, yeah. going to pay the big duties on tomatoes? What's going on? So, you know, it's kind of sad that we are becoming a protectionist nation and uh, uh, trying to put duties on so many different products. So what happened in China is uh, when Deng had the experiment of a free zone in China, what, what China started doing uh, is they started putting on these uh, enterprise zones, economic enterprise zones, and they'd go in and uh, they'd, they'd take an area of land, and one thing that China can do, they can say, we're going to make this an enterprise zone. <laughs> and it became an enterprise zone. And, but what they did is they did all the infrastructure. They did the roads, the lighting, the heating, the phones, and so forth. Give the land to the factories. So we saw it happen. And the fact is, when we start visiting these uh, factories, they say, by the way, come and see us next year. We're going to have a new factory in this enterprise zone. We go back six months later and they'd have a million square foot factory in production in six months. And we saw it over and over again. So that's one advantage they have, is they can do this in six months. Uh, we just expanded our parking lot here at Compark. It took it nine months just to get the per permits to expand the parking lot. So that's one advantage they have, they can, they can get stuff done. So what happened, they moved up the coast from Xinjiang, they moved up to Xiamen, which is right across from Taiwan. And they kind of skipped Shanghai and went up to Tianjin. And but we saw these enterprise zones in China just opening up. And what we saw was the inf infrastructure. All of a sudden, we saw roads and everything. Uh, in 1982, uh, when I took our first trip to mainland China, uh, I had my daughter and son along with me. We saw piles of rice along the road. And we said, what are these piles of rice doing along the road? Well, what happened, and one thing that changed uh, the communist China into a capitalist China was uh, food. Um, growing up on the farm ranch in Montana, we used to send all our wheat to Russia. I remember that very well. Uh, but uh, Deng decided that we're going to let the farmers free market half of their crops. And that was in 1980. 
So from, from that, it, that statement, letting farmers free market half the crop, all of us touch China, instead of becoming an importer of rice and grain and stuff, actually became an exporter. So in 1982, they had an excess of rice. And the reason this rice was piled along the roads is that they didn't, couldn't take it to market. They didn't have the infrastructure to take it to market. They didn't have the roads, didn't have the deep sea ports, didn't have the containers. But just that quick, by changing the free market into the crops, China became an exporter. So that's really where the whole free enterprise, free market concept started, is by letting farmers free market half of their crops. So today, the economy of Russia, uh, excuse me, China really runs on, on uh, a capitalist free market system. Uh, it's called a capitalist uh, communist uh, society. So uh, anyway, uh, we were up in uh, Tianjin, and there was a factory up there called Markar, and uh, we saw him grow from a small factory. And the last time out there, he had 13 million square feet of production, 10 thousand employees. And he made the furniture for a lot of the high-end American companies, Broyhill, uh, uh, Thomasville, Drexel Heritage, and Heritage, and those companies. And uh, he always had a huge luncheon. And at that time we were traveling, there was a, we had a group here in America called the, Seven of, uh, the Summit of Eight, where eight of us biggest dealers traveled and shared things and traveled to uh, China and Asia together. So uh, 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 Richard Fung, who was the owner of Mark or, uh, he has a big lunch and you have to sit in lunch. So he asked me to sit beside him and he wanted to talk to me. So he sit beside me and he says, I just travel all over U.S. And you have best furniture store in U.S. He said, you and I, we go partners and we open American furniture warehouse stores all over China. I said, I'll get back to you. So he wanted me to go to partners with him and also open up America for that. This was a big deal because he had just did an IPO and he had a lot of money, very, very successful. And I made a decision that I didn't want to spend half of my life in China. So I turned him down on his offer. So since then, he uh, went partners with Ethan Allen. And today, there's hundreds and hundreds of Marcor stores all over China. And Ethan Allen is, a, is, is their partner. Um, so. Um, Go check my notes real quick. So anyway, uh, what, what happened on this 10% uh, thing they just put on, uh, so many factories, uh, when we, were, we just got back, we just, I go to Asia twice a year. In March, we normally go to uh, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, China, and then in September, we go up and basically, uh, uh, most of the time we spend in, in China. Uh, we have people on the ground there, we have uh, people. Uh, maybe talk just a minute about supply chains. Uh, I think we've got the supply chain figured out. What we do, we, we buy direct containers from factories. Uh, we make uh, deals with shipping. We have five uh, shipping co contracts with shipping co contracts. And by the way, last year we bought 8,000 containers. This year we're projected to do 10,000 containers. So uh, we're big enough where we can have shipping contracts. So uh, they put the containers on, of course, on the, on the uh, ships and bring them in and take them to the warehouses and we unload them. So our, our supply chain is pretty simple, from the factory to American Furniture Warehouse. <laughs> now, here's where uh, some of the costs in furniture get, 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 get out of control. Uh, so many people that are buying and uh, importing, they have to have an agent to find the products. Now what we do is we have people on the ground and what we do is we pay them a small commission, a 1% commission or 2% commission, the source for us and that for uh, There's five people, three of them are ex-Mormon missionaries that learned to speak fluent uh, Chinese when they were missionaries to Taiwan. Uh, so they're ex-Mormon missionaries. Uh, two of them are Chinese. Uh, one of them lives in Vietnam and one lives in China. And if we pay them like one or towards, but they also, QC, quality control. They go to factories and quality control and make sure that the merchandise is good. So for 1% commission or 2% commission, we get actually quality control and finding new products for us. So that's, uh, so we eliminate the agents. Like a lot of agents would charge maybe 10%. 
So the agent turns around and he's and he's got to find somebody to buy it. So he gets an importer or a, a warehouse guy or, or somebody like that and sells it to them. So they mark it up maybe another 30, 40 percent. So the warehouse guy's got to make a catalog and figure out how to sell it. Maybe hires a decorator to, to get the products. So she wants another 40 percent. And then finally find a dealer to sell it and they mark it up another 40 <laughs> percent. So that's why, like, uh, for example, we buy these, uh, we, we call them twigs. My daughter buys these, by the way, we, we these twigs. And you can buy these at American Furniture Warehouse for $48. And you can sell them in other stores here in Colorado. They get $300. We sell them for $48, they get $300. Bucks. So it's because markups, jobbers, distributors, designers, retailers. So that, that's why we import, because we're buying it direct from the factory and don't have all of those markers. So we've got the ch supply chain, chain, chain uh, figured out. Uh, right now, uh, we're buying from uh, t average between 12 and 25 countries we import from. And I'm just going to go through the, our 12 big ones real quickly. Uh, Mexico. Mexico is, uh, we've been buying from Mexico forever. And by the way, Mexico is no longer a protectionist country. Remember when Mexico was a protectionist country, they didn't want anything imported or exported? That's changed. I think NAFTA changed that. Now, now they're so Mexico, and the nice thing about Mexico, uh, Mexico for years was around 100 million people. I checked the other day, it's now 129 million people. So they got bigger families, so they got more people. Plus, a lot of the immigrants coming up from Honduras to Guatemala go through Mexico, and some of them are finding jobs in Mexico. Pretty cool. So I think Mexico is going to be a real player. We've already seen where some of the furniture factories are moving from because of the duties are already moving from China to, to Mexico. Italy. We buy uh, uh, all leather sofa, leather sofas from Italy. Huge, huge business for us. Um, Vietnam. Like I say, the bedroom sets are 22 bedroom sets. Out of, plus the Vietnam is making dining room and other products. Malaysia. We still buy from Malaysia. Malaysia uh, like we found way back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, we still buy there. Uh, they have rubber wood. They have rubber wood plantations there, and they have a, rubber wood's a good uh, hardwood makes furniture. So the Korea, we're buying our Samsung TVs out of Korea. Imagine that. Where are you going to buy TV from? They don't make them in America anymore, so you have to buy them from somewhere. Canada makes some nice contemporary furniture by that. India, India is becoming a player because you know India has 1.4 million people. And the thing that's always kind of held India back is, uh, you know, when they were British owned until 1948, kind of a socialist country and, and uh, not uh, much free enterprise, but that's changing today. And I see going forward where India, they used to have a lot of small factories. If you had a big factory, a lot of employees, you had to pay 80% tax. That's changing as we speak because India is learning. I think other, you know, what, what Vietnam really do, they took uh, China's model of, of having these enterprise zones and opening these enterprise zones, they just really copied China. And I think uh, you're going to see India copying China on some of that too. But right now we're buying a lot of this uh, vintage uh, furniture out of India. It's reclaimed, reclaimed furniture, real rustic. People like that stuff. I dropped my notes here. Sorry about that. Oh well. Anyway, uh, we're buying a lot of this uh, vintage uh, industrial stuff out of, out of India. Poos and pillows, pillows. We're buying a lot of, we're buying containers of pillows out of India. Indonesia, Indonesia. We have always bought from Indonesia for years. Uh, make some solid wood, some teak wood out of Indonesia. Cambodia. I got a call yesterday, one of our, uh, our biggest RTA supplier out of China. But we're, what we do, like we're negotiating with them now on the, on the 25%. Uh, like when, the, when they did the 10% in September, uh, they devalued the RMB 8% right after that. And so uh, right away the Chinese factories could give you better deals or pay some of the tariffs, which they did. So we negotiated with them to pay part of the tariffs. Now there's 25, we're calling our factory and say, you know, how much of the tariffs are you going to participate in? So our biggest RTA dealer, which is we're doing millions of dollars with them, says, you know what, we have a plant in Cambodia. 
and we're going to ship you out of Cambodia. This is the real world. This is what's happening. So they're going to ship us out of Cambodia. Also, we're buying already buying some bedroom and Jackson Catnap or all our cut and stones come out of Cambodia. So we've been out of buying out of Cambodia for a long time. Turkey, we're buying rugs out of Turkey and have for a long time. We still buy a few things from, from Taiwan. So anyway, that's uh, basically uh, who our, our, our bigger importers are. Uh, Vietnam now is full. Vietnam only has 103 million people. Uh, they can't, you couldn't, you don't need to open another factory in Vietnam. Land prices are high and are out of employees. One advantage that Vietnam had over China, and I think the reason that some of these factories moved from China to Vietnam, is that in Vietnam you, uh, you build a factory where the employees are. One trouble with China always was with the Chinese New Year. How many of you guys are importing out of China? Isn't that Chinese New Year a, <laughs> a disruptor? <laughs> you got to wait two weeks, and that two weeks has turned into three weeks or four weeks. And the reason for that was China was getting their workers from the rural areas. So China had to build uh, uh, apartments and stuff for, for them to live at. And uh, then so they'd have the, they didn't go home. So they gave them, the, they had that, it was called the Chinese New Year. For two weeks, they could, could go back home. Well, that, like I said, that's truly turned out to be a disruptor because a lot of those workers don't come back or they stay for longer than two weeks, so this tiny New Year's. Now, one advantage that Vietnam had and uh, all these other countries have, they don't have the Chinese New Year. So what these factories that are doing that are building in Vietnam, they're building the factories where the employees are. So all they have to do is get their motor scooters and ride to work. How many of you have been to Vietnam? They got motor scooters in Vietnam? Man, do they have motor scooters. So, Anyway, so they, they could build the factories where the workers are and they don't have that Chinese uh, New Year. So they're gonna go to the low cost provider. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, I maybe have a few minutes to talk about my, how I got to American Furniture Warehouse. Okay, I'll make it, make it fast. Uh, I, uh, my parents came from Europe. My dad was born right in Poland. My mother was born in Russia. One comment I wanna make is, uh, uh, I went to Poland uh, when it was still a communist country. This was in the early 70s. And uh, they had no, we'd go to a department store, they had nothing on the shelves. One reason the communist system didn't work is they were protectionists and they wouldn't trade. They wouldn't trade. And to go into the department stores, they had no, my, uh, I went with a friend of mine, he was Polish and had relatives there, and we each put $50 in a kitty. We had $100 that we were going to blow spending a week in Poland. After a week in Poland, we couldn't spend the hundred dollars. There was nothing to buy, nothing to buy. Food was rationed. The, the message here is that the one reason the communist system didn't work, I went to Russia, I spent a week in Russia. My mother was from Russia. My dad was born and raised in Poland. And uh, they were lined up around the block just to buy groceries. There's one reason the communists failed, they wouldn't trade. They were isolationists and they wouldn't trade. So the shelves were empty. An old Chinese verb, you cannot sell from an empty shell bookcase. You cannot buy from empty shelves. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, that was one reason they failed. So anyway, real quickly, uh, uh, nine kids in my family, uh, born and raised in Lodge Grass, Montana. It's a small town in Montana. How small was it? I was born, I was born November 23rd and I won the first baby of the year contest. <laughs> we had a sign on the edge of town at slow down, resume speed, both on the same sign. I went back for my class reunion last summer. I was the only one there. I'm trying to figure out who sent me the invitation. Uh, my dad, uh, Always wanted, my dad only went to second grade, and my mother only went seventh grade, and there were nine kids in my family, and he insisted we go to college. So we all went to college. We all, uh, a lot of us graduated from college. So I graduated from Montana State College. Uh, Korean War was on. Uh, dad says, take ROTC. I took ROTC, got a commission in the Air Force. That was in the draft. Anybody remember the draft? Anyway, so, uh, and uh, my first assignment, I was stationed at a radar site in Point of Rita, California. You had to have a secret clearance to that. I was adjutant and personnel officer at this radar site, and I filled out an application for a top secret clearance, 
So Twix came in and said, we need an officer to go at the European theater of war with the top secret clearance. Korean War is over here. I'm going to Europe with a top secret clearance. I landed up, spent most of my military career in Mo French Morocco, uh, uh, delivering top secret mail all over Africa, all the military installations. And there was a civil war going on when I was there. The French were booting the Arabs out. And I landed up delivering all diplomatic mail, got flying pay, got traveled 24 countries. Um, so uh, great experience for a 21-year-old second tenant. Back then, now fast, this was the 50s, there was no schools for the Arabs in Morocco at that time. And one reason that I support education, I believe that the problem and the whole Middle East thing is, is, a, is a literacy problem. I think if they had education, and particularly they treat the women terrible, as you guys know, if, they were, if the whole problem in the Middle East, and I support schools in Pakistan and Afghanistan and places like that. And I think you should too. I think if that part of the world was uh, more educated, it would go away. So I'm about out of time, right? How much time have I got? Two minutes, okay. So real quickly, uh, got out of the service. Uh, I have four of us brothers were in the military at the same time. I went back to the farm. Two of my brothers were already back. It was a small farm. And uh, so uh, I took off, started playing music. I hooked up the Grand Ole Opry group, started playing music, and um, like I said, toured with Marty Robbins. And I was in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, I was at play by guitar for Ray Price. Anybody remember Ray Price with Pierce? And uh, they, they, Ray Price says, come up and rehearse with us and go on tour. I made a decision that night to go back to Bozeman, Montana because I worked my way through college playing music and teaching guitar. I actually made money playing guitar and, and uh, teaching music going to college. And uh, I, so I went back and I opened a guitar studio. This is in the 50s, Secret to Free Enterprise. And that's in your booklet too, The Secret to Free, Enter Free Enterprise, my uh, that speeches I give to uh, college kids, 39 Reasons for business, business Success, which is pretty popular around. But number one, find a need, fill a need. So I was teaching guitar in the 50s. And I'll end up buying half interest in a music store and uh, I'll end up uh, selling furniture. Found out everybody needed furniture, not everybody needed a guitar. And uh, so, in a way, that's why I got into furniture business. So, that's my quick journey on how I got to American Furniture. Hey, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking for oh, us and sharing pleasure. your great uh, experience. Uh, can we get another round of applause for this wonderful <laughs> um, We have some time for a couple of questions. He's willing to take them. Anybody out there? I have a hard time seeing you, so if you could stand. Come on. Somebody? Yes? Yes, please. I, I'm interested to know what percentage of your products would be considered made in America. Okay, yeah. Or, Can you repeat that question? Yeah, the, the question was what percentage of our product? It's around around 50%. We buy American every time. I, I've got my whole, have you guys have seen my semis and my fleet of whole semis? I got 500 uh, tractor and trailers that we run all over the country. It's easy to buy in America. Send a purchase order, send a semi out, pick it up. And by the way, we have back hauls with our semis, so they're running full all the time. I'd buy America, but unfortunately, a lot of things just aren't made in America. Not a lot of furniture. Uh, all of that first duties they put on bedroom sets, they put in there, we're gonna save these factories. It didn't work. The factories just kept closing. Right now, you can almost count the amount of North Carolina factories on one hand that are left. So they kept close. So we would buy America never can. But upholstery, what they're doing is they're buying cut and sewn kits coming out of China, out of uh, Vietnam, out of Cambodia, out of Mexico, whatever. So most upholstery is manufactured in America. 
good, a lot of good manufacturers here in America, Ashley, Lane, and so forth. Uh, so that's about 35% of the business. Now, bedroom sets or bedding mattresses are mostly made. There's five uh, mattress factories here in Colorado. So most of the mattresses are made. Now, that's another 15%. So what's that, 35, 50? Now you're right at 50%. There's still a few good bedroom companies made in America. That's pretty much it. So, but roughly half is made in America, half is import. And one reason the import, guys, I think if you import, you have a lot broader range of products. You're going to make maybe a little more margin on some of that stuff. I encourage all of you to import. And one reason I'm importing, who are the big players? Walmart, Costco, Target, Ikea. It's pretty much all imports. I wanted to, I wanted to play with the big boys. So, so, I, uh, so anyway, so I, I think a combination. Does that make sense? A combination between importing uh, and, and buying locally. Uh, the best one is the twigs. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, we're only paying about, uh, I think it's about 10 or 12 bucks for those and sell them for 38, 48 dollars. It's unreal because uh, well, there's of course a lot of handling and there's freight in it, in it too. So maybe one of the, the best ones. Uh, probably some of the, probably the worst mistakes I, I made. Your no. competitors are selling it for 200 So, so, yeah, yeah. so uh, probably once in a great while, uh, you get a quality problem coming out of China. We just run into one the other day. Uh, and finding a factory that'll, that'll back it up. But very, very few mistakes in importing, very few. Great. Well, now we know why he's so successful. Thank you so much, Jake. Appreciate you being here. Congratulations on your success.